Over the past few weeks, I've been doing a lot of the Bojan Southern Front, and been watching and reading all the different takes on the content. Some negative, some lukewarm. But I'm going to be mostly positive. I enjoyed Eureka back when that first came out, so I figured I would enjoy this too. So as long as they were taking steps forward to improve the formula. A lot of people though, seem to be of the opinion that these weren't steps forward. So let's talk about Bosia and how it's improved upon Eureka. In Eureka, leveling was probably one of the worst features of the entire piece of content. When first getting to Anemos, you're weak and basically worthless. You're level 1, and you are given a single piece of Magicite to put into your Magia board. So as you struggled to kill stuff, you earned tiny amounts of EXP and slowly leveled up. Eventually, people started to learn how to spawn notorious monsters, and the Fate Train began. So you would follow it to the ends of the Earth while walking slowly because of how mounts were locked. You also couldn't teleport until you got to high levels as Aetherites were locked to specific levels, which were pretty high. Once you got a bit into the levels, you'd have to go deeper into the zone to find enemies worth killing if you didn't follow the Fate Train. But that means getting into more dangerous areas around more dangerous enemies. Especially if you didn't go back and do your quests. Quests that you would probably die trying to do because they were placed in some of the hottest enemy spots guaranteeing something would aggro you and kill you. But hey, that's most of the map. Enemies are so tightly packed together into the map, even though the map is huge, it's basically impossible to dodge around everything. So you would die, and unless someone was kind enough to raise you, take a hefty EXP penalty. I believe half a level, no matter your level setting you back quite a bit, and possibly even de-leveling you. You may not have even gone into the right place since the quests have no markers, only directions of go east to pick me bows, or the like. But trying again, you succeed and got one piece of Magicite, boosting your power by quite a bit. Repeat three more times and you're now actually worth something. And by that point, Anemos is already done. And you're no longer able to help new friends through the content. I believe the cutoff point was 8 levels above another player, and they would stop getting EXP for kills. Meaning their only option when playing with you was to join the Fate Train. Though, you followed it too. Because killing basic enemies was nearly worthless. But at least now you know the map just in time for 90% of the enemies to no longer aggro you because you outlevel them enough. Hopefully you have a two-seater to carry your newbie friend around though through the content. It was a mess, through and through. So much so, they had to add in a challenge log section for killing normal enemies, just to make leveling through Eureka as a new player less terrible now that most of the player base has moved on to the later sections of Eureka and other content. Bogia has corrected basically all of this. From the start, you have mounts. Your ability to run across distances is so easy compared to Eureka. Enemies are also no longer super tightly packed together. Sure, there's plenty of enemies all over, some of them far more dangerous than those around them, but you can basically outrun everything and dodge the rest of it. The only thing that's been downgraded really is the leashing distances. Enemies in Bogia will chase you down. You have to basically run half of the zone away for enemies to de-aggro you. It's ridiculous. And they can even chase you into camps. This is one of the biggest negatives I have with Bogia, despite the overall improvements. While they bug fixed an AI bug that would cause enemies to de-aggro onto other players when running back to their spawn point, I almost died at the first camp due to this. Someone brought an enemy into camp, de it, and then it locked onto me. They made zero attempt to pull the enemy off of me, despite it being their own fault that I was being attacked. I was talking to a damn NPC at that moment. 
I had no way to defend myself unless I just quickly clicked through all the NPC dialogue, and there was like six or seven boxes before I finally got free. This is fixed now, but enemies can still make their way into camps, some of them with some huge AoEs that can hit people not fighting, though they're definitely not going to kill you unless you are already extremely weak. But that aside, exploring is so much easier to do now, though this could be seen as a negative. Since levels are no longer a thing, instead we have rank, all areas remain dangerous no matter what. But every area is on the average way less dangerous since there's much more leeway with dodging mobs and the average mob is on the average weaker. They may have toned it back a bit too much and tried to make up for it with the leashing range, though it could just be that I'm so used to Anemos and Pegos levels of enemies that this is a striking that balance, and I just can't tell. Overall though, I'd say movement is vastly improved. All of this is also top on the map size. Bogia is a much smaller map than any of the Eureka maps. It leads to a much faster paced, much more condensed experience. The amount of running in a straight line Eureka had was not exactly compelling. When you hit that point of enemies all ignoring you, it was just a straight shot to the goal, and since you spent most of your time at max level trying to farm for the weapons and armor, you spent most of the time running in a straight line. But since enemies always aggro you in Bogia, you will at least make small changes in your line to dodge an enemy or two for what is already a much shorter trip. And no, the dragons were not a solution to this. At that point, you just ran in a straight line while using RP walk. It wasn't any better. And as said, your level is not actually a level in here. It's a rank. There is no Magia function either, which is why I didn't even explain what all that meant because it's just gone, and we are better off for it. You are now at full power the moment you get into the instance. Grinding your rank to max gives you no benefit outright. It gives you more options, especially with the lost actions, but no direct power. The only power boosts you can get are the lost actions, and I'll go over those later. This alone is such a huge benefit. Anemos was pretty alright, but collecting the Magia to no longer be a worthless loser was grueling in itself. And because enemies no longer give EXP, any rank player can help any rank friends. I, as a rank 15, can help a new rank 1 friend in Bogia. I can't do that in Eureka. I would prevent my friends from gaining EXP entirely outside of the Notorious Monster spawns. Though this comes with the slight drawback that Notorious Monsters are now functionally the only way to level. But let's not pretend that wasn't the case in Eureka anyway. They simply removed the formality. If anything, it became the challenge log I couldn't help my friends with, and that was already a band-aid fix to the fact that the train was the best way to level up. And because of all of this, death is so much less scary. Sure, dying now in itself causes you to lose EXP, a very, very tiny amount, but the respawn penalty seems to be a lot less painful in itself, and much less likely to happen. The small size of the map basically means anyone can easily come save you, and even if you do take a respawn penalty, you don't rank down. You'll lose EXP, sure, but you won't lose a rank. I could theoretically go die over and over right now, hit zero points, and still be rank 15, and I won't be any weaker like I would be in Eureka. And also, because of how this place works, EXP now scales with your rank, unlike in Eureka. You gain more EXP the higher rank you are, so leveling always stays swift, even at that level 14 to 15 barrier. So what originally took 10 hours 
may now only take 5 because of EXP gains being so much higher once you're a higher rank. It's just so much easier in every single aspect. Like, god, I can't even properly relate just how much improved the leveling experience is. So movement is better, your ability to level is better, your ability to keep that level is ever present, and quests actually tell you where to go. A lot of people seem to be very directionally challenged if Eureka was any indication. While the quests weren't exactly telling of where to go, if a quest said to go east, some people would just go west. It's a big change to go from how the game normally works with quest markers to nothing. Well, Bogia brought them back. Your mileage may vary there, but some of the quests, especially in Anomos, were kinda stupid to do. So I kinda don't feel bad about them putting the quest markers back in. I'd rather it this way, honestly. The only design decision that seemed to carry on unscathed is locking Aetherites to specific levels, but even that is kinda different. Entire sections of the map are cut off instead of just the teleports. The teleports are good positions and would be great to have earlier than when you get them, but rank 5 and 8 aren't exactly difficult to achieve, especially compared to Eureka. They're locked to quest progress as well, not just level, but it's still way shorter than what Eureka required. Plus, the quests are so easy, they might as well not exist as a barrier. So in summation, as far as travel, questing, leveling, and all that stuff, it's much improved. The biggest issue I had was basically just a bug. Some of the problems remain overall, but it's not going to get you killed without being malicious and on purpose. And at that point, it's a bannable offense. But that aside, what do we actually do to rank up? Rather than notorious monsters, we now have skirmishes and critical engagements. The former are basically just fates. Sometimes a boss, sometimes collections, the usual stuff. The good stuff, the interesting stuff, is from critical engagements. Most of these seem to spawn on their own, but the important ones all spawn from killing robots in the vicinity of the spawn location. A few minutes of killing enemies is plenty enough when an instance is fresh. Critical engagements are fancy fate bosses with a limited play account typically 48 players. Unless you use return before the fight begins, you're trapped inside until your group or the boss is dead. And these are far more complex than your average fate boss. Often more complex than even most dungeon bosses. These are intense even for the easiest one. It brings plenty of raid mechanics out too. Stuff like Chaos from V9, Hearts from A7 and T, Construct 7 in several new and murderous forms, and that's not even talking about the duels, but we'll talk about those later. Overall though, I love it. It's so much more engaging than the majority of the notorious monsters from Eureka. Sure, most of it is just the normal fates, the skirmishes, but when you actually get to do a critical engagement, you're in for something far more engaging than most other things. The only real interesting notorious monsters for Eureka were the final ones, Pazuzu, Luigi, Penny, and the Big Dragon. That's one per instance. All of the critical engagements here, even the easy ones, I would say are fun. The issues really come into play in that they're all on respawn timers, just like in Eureka, and they all spawn block each other. There are about four critical engagements per section of the map, plus a duel, so 15 total. However, there are two instances of two critical engagements spawning at once. One in the middle area, and one in the top area. So functionally, 
This reduces the critical engagement count to 13. But let's take out the duels. We're now down to 10. 4 in the south, 3 mid, and 3 top. We traded quantity for quality. There isn't a single bad critical engagement. The worst one was probably the literal first one with the Mandragora. It was unfriendly to colorblind players, and has since been patched to be friendlier. Further, every critical engagement is a closed off arena, where Eureka was all open spaces with the rare exceptions of the final bosses of an area. So mechanics were simple at best, and randomly destructive at worst. Critical engagements get to have specific mechanics that always work correctly since it has an arena. Boss is designed to go to the middle of the arena? There is a programmed middle to that arena. Really, these are miniature trials. They're simple enough to be doable blind, but more complex than any random fate. And they all feel very different and completely distinct in how you handle the fights. Super skilled raiders won't see much of anything they haven't before, but this isn't made for the 1%. This was made for everyone to do, but even we should be able to enjoy the level of difficulty and variety thrown at us. I really do enjoy these a ton, but they're not perfect. As mentioned, they spawn block each other. There can only be one critical engagement on the map at once, with the exception of Lacus Latour, which by all accounts isn't actually a critical engagement. So you can kill a critical engagement in the first section, and not see another critical engagement for another 30 minutes, because the critical engagements in the middle and north are spawning. Or the reverse. This can be especially annoying once you hit level 8 and start farming the third area. Critical engagements give way more EXP than the skirmishes, which will always have a few up in every section of the map. But each area's skirmishes and critical engagements give progressively more EXP than the previous. Let's say for example, the third area skirmishes give 1000 metal per clear. At level 8, a critical engagement in the southern zone will give you 1000 metal for clearing it. It becomes functionally pointless to do the critical engagements in the south if your goal is leveling up. Now obviously, I am all about fun and that's a really good reason to do the southern critical engagements at a high level, but there is an end goal at rank 10, so for at least two levels, you ideally are going to just completely skip critical engagements in the southern section of the map. This is a very minor point though, as there's plenty of people per instance. 72 in fact. The critical engagement is guaranteed to fill to near max even in the worst circumstances, so you're not exactly needed. But that means you're not doing the most interesting part of Bogia. Some of the skirmishes aren't exactly boring and can kill you pretty easily, but they're a far cry from what the critical engagement experience is. But we can't tune up the number of critical engagements available at once either. 48 players per critical engagement is more than half of the instance, it's two thirds. The times where two critical engagements spawn together, the second is a smaller critical engagement of 24 people, so all 72 players can do a critical engagement, provided they are high enough level to do the critical engagements. And even if we did tune up to two critical engagements at once, and that had no issues with filling them, we'd run into the fact that we run out of critical engagements really fast. They're on an hour long cooldown. You can easily run through most critical engagements within an hour already. It has just the perfect amount that I think there can always be one available. But if the same level of quality and quantity is to be kept up, they can't increase the spawn count and speed. 
but we still have skirmishes even if you do run out of critical engagements. Maybe we'll see a bunch of 24-man critical engagements in the next section of Bogia? Or they'll at least take away the fact that duels, which only one person can do, keep in mind, will stop spawn blocking other critical engagements? There's no reason that the entire instance should have to wait on one person to finish their duel. Yeah, sure, it's beneficial to the one person to not have to worry about missing other critical engagements, but they're one person, and there's 71 other people who may be waiting for critical engagements. But overall though, my point is, this is way more engaging than Eureka ever was. But it doesn't mean it's perfectly better. There is one side effect to the change in content to have constant fate uptime. The system seems to be similar as to the overworld. Doing fates within a zone will scale up future fates based on participation. However, even with extreme scaling due to high traffic, some of these fates can be soloed by NPCs before you ever reach them. This was especially pronounced in the Northern Zone when the scaling was low due to nobody being high rank yet. But even with some pretty high scaling, some of these fates still just melt by the NPCs alone. Meanwhile, other skirmishes end up being super impossible without a light party. It's really, really weird. Is this going to be a theme with Vosia? It's a very small point overall, but it sticks out to me as something that could come back and be a major issue. It's why I gave it its own section, despite only having two paragraphs to mention it. It made the first few days a bit rough in the third zone, but it wasn't much an issue beyond that. Hopefully this is just an overreaction on my end, and it's not going to be an issue in future. A returning feature of the second half of Eureka is Logos, now called Lost Actions. When killing stuff or doing certain objectives, you'll obtain Forgotten Fragments. Trading these in will give one of many possible actions depending on the fragment, each fragment listing the actions contained within. These can all be special skills that change your role or vastly boost your role's main feature. Instant death attacks, or status effects. However, this is much improved upon Eureka once again. In Eureka, some actions were only obtainable by mixing multiple other actions together, and there were chances of failure when mixing, especially when trying to mix multiple actions at once since equipping Logos was essentially gear sets. So you could fail in making a gear set and lose a bunch of actions, and these things weren't cheap depending on the action. Some actions only came from killing sprites, others from doing special bunny fates and getting golden chests, which was very rare. As a result, the situation was pretty dire. Get very lucky, or have deep pockets. Here in Bogia, however, fragments are way, way easier to get. Level was an issue in Eureka, since if an enemy had a specific skill was level 40, and you're 50, you can't get any drops from that level 40 enemy anymore. You're too high a level. But rank isn't a level anymore, so any enemies that have good drops of fragments are always open to be killed by you. Just hope nobody else is taking the farm spot. Or join them, you can do that. There's also star mobs, easily murderable with lost death casts, and drops a ton of fragments per star mob. They respawn every 30 minutes, so not even hard to farm those. There's no mixing either. And most importantly, no bunnies. Thank God. Instead of mixing and gear sets, you have an allowance amount. Ranking up will increase your allowance of how many actions you can carry at once. You can have a potion, 
a re-raise, an essence, and two lost actions all active for zero cost. As long as they aren't counted within your inventory, they're free game. So at rank 15, you can have all of your buffs active and action slotted that you could want, and an additional 70 points worth of actions, each action having a different cost to have them in your inventory. This is so much more flexible and so much more usable and friendly than what Eureka had. One fragment, one action. You don't need to go through two stacks of fragments to get two separate rare actions that combine into an even rarer action that you have to manage to slot into a gear set. You just get that rare action outright, and since the fragments are all easy to farm for the most part, throwing money at it is also a solution for everyone and not just the wealthy. Further, some of the most important logos in Eureka were just passive buffs you turned on and never turned back off. These have become the aforementioned essences and re-raise buffs. They're items you use, then you actually put on your real action set. It's so much better in every way, and the actions are just as varied as always. We have death, we have special risk reward actions, we have lost slash that lets people do 700k in a single hit when combined with boost. You can become a healing tank, or a DPS tank, that's as fragile as the DPS, but as strong as one too. The number of options make the content more than just the same as the open world. Lost actions vastly transform the experience in very fun ways if you're willing to experiment. A strategy I enjoy that isn't quite one of the overpowered ones is Banner of Noble Ends and Font of Magic, with an Aether Stored. That's a 40% damage boost for 15 seconds and a 70% damage boost for 30 seconds that drains your mana, which is where the Aether come in and completely negates that issue. Some of the actions are absolute trash like Dynamis Dice, which can place doom on you. Not worth the positive effects you can get, but the fact that it's an option at all is kinda neat. The base gameplay can get boring at times, even at max level, and these are quite the spice to change things up, even a little. But some of them are hyper-specific. Some of them exist purely for duels. Duels are probably the feature I enjoy the most about Bogia, and also have the most criticism of. Before we get into the duels themselves, let's go back to the beginning. When we first get into the instance, critical engagements will be spawning, or maybe it'll be a fresh instance and none spawning yet. So we head out to the location of the dual critical engagement and start killing robots. Only a few minutes will pass before the skirmish spawns in that location, signaling the critical engagement has been successfully spawned. Completion of this skirmish will officially spawn the critical engagement. For participating in this skirmish, you are given a priority buff to join the critical engagement. So you join that. Now comes the interesting part. You must have a perfect run of this critical engagement, which means no vulnerability stacks and no deaths. You must understand and perform the mechanics on at least a basic level, Pro provided you did this, upon completion of the critical engagement there will be a very short delay before a different pop-up appears asking if you'd like to duel one of three opponents. The opponent is based on the area, Gabriel in the south, Lion the Beast in the middle, and the north having Fire Pepsi. The problem is, these are duels. One on one. One person can get in. Everyone else is not allowed in. They can watch the duel from the outside, but so can everyone else who didn't even qualify to do it. So if we, for example, take Gabriel, it's quite common for up to 20 people to qualify to fight him and also accept the queue. 
all 20 of you who accepted the duel have a chance to get put in. And sadly, people are awful, worthless creatures, and some people will purposefully take the duel just to fail it so nobody else can do it. The good news is these people will be easily banned since they all love to brag about it, but the fact that people can do this for no penalty until a GM steps in is quite annoying. It's not the fault of the content itself, but it is a side effect I hope they can find a solution for, though I don't think there ever can be a solution to these types of players other than report and ban. Perhaps anyone who does not receive a permaban for these actions can be put on a permanent blacklist that causes all dual queues to be passed over them entirely? Even then, that's a stretch. Even in the best case scenarios. There's also the quote-unquote issue of people doing these blind or making dumb mistakes. People get real salty if you don't show yourself to be an expert player 24-7. I made some especially stupid mistakes on some runs. The lion clear I have posted is even filled with mistakes to the point that I saw in rage. But there's also runs where I just never put on mana wall, or the run where the Fire Eyes AoE was inaccurate and changed its aim. I've luckily never experienced the, oh my god, what a loser for not doing good stuff, but maybe I did well enough for whatever barrier to entry people have for the run being good enough for them. Or I got an audience who was accepting of mistakes, since they did all comfort me after, because I showed great anger at my failures, so people could see even if I was poor, I had much more potential than I showed. I don't know. Point is, you could be the most prepared person in the world and just never see the inside of a duel because of jerks or people unprepared. I can't say it doesn't hurt to lose to the latter person, but as long as they genuinely are trying, it's whatever. I can go spawn the duel again. They take almost no time to spawn overall. But Gabriel was just really bad to get into. Somehow, so many people qualify, and because it's the first area, most people have no clue what to do. So 10 spawns later, I finally get in and win. But every other time I spawned, with some random person who failed one to two mechanics in. Again, I'm fine with people taking their shot because they earned it, they managed to qualify, but I entirely understand where the assholes are coming from when they whine about a duel being wasted. But they're forgetting that for the first week or so, every duel was a waste due to how they work. The biggest problem I can argue against in duels is that all three of them, without exception, have a specific set of actions they require to even complete. Unless you super speed kill and skip the mechanic like machinists can with their three minute speed kills. But even they need some actions that are specific to the fight. Lion's first ability requires dispel. It's the literal first thing he does. There's no way around it. You need Dispel, or everything is going to hurt way too hard. And then, it's not even that long after that you need Mana Wall. You do maybe four mechanics before Mana Wall comes up. Even the speediest DPS will still need to Mana Wall on Lion. Even the mechanics you can skip on the other fights due to speed, you at least need that specific setup of actions that allow you to be so powerful and speed kill. These fights do require at least a minimum skill level to clear, but no matter how skillful you are, you'll at least need specific skills and preparation. I'm not entirely sure how to feel about this. It makes sense that Bogia fights would require Bogia skills, but getting into a solo duel is so rare sometimes, so you really can't put yourself into a progression mindset the same way you would an actual raid. A raid you basically can never clear blind due to how new mechanics pop up. 
but there's no entry requirements besides just queuing. Even if the mechanics you keep wiping on is five minutes into the fight, you just get back to that part of the fight. Five minutes might be the quickest time to just spawn the skirmish to spawn the critical engagement. But you need to clear that, clear the critical engagement perfectly, and get picked all before you can even attempt to progress the fight more. And all of the fights will require a level of progression due to their requiring specific actions. The requirement of actions makes sense, but the barrier to entry is so high that it comes off entirely as a negative than something they should reiterate on next time. It's something I'll just have to trust them on to do right, but I don't like that. I would rather die to me not looking ahead and dying because I did a mechanic poorly and didn't prepare, than to not preparing for something I could have never seen coming, like needing mana wall. But again, I'll just have to trust them and hope for the best, because I really do like duels. These three fights are extremely fun when you get past your nerves. They combine old and new mechanics together in fun ways that really test the abilities of those who face them. Lion especially. The Heart of the Beast with two puddles and four exaflares are really a sight to behold despite the relative simplicity of the solution. The nerves are the hardest mechanic, on the level of ultimate rage personally, but it makes the fight far more complex because of the mental games. But the mechanics aren't simple on their own. I mean, they are for the most part, but they are tough enough to genuinely grant a challenge I want to continue to chase in the future. And this is something Eureka only offered in the Baldesian arsenal. I know I'm probably the minority of people, but it's truly something I would like to see more of. I'm a challenge chaser, and these are accessible for a more casual audience while still trying to be difficult and I want more. I just hope that they work something in to go around the fact that they are duels. Let multiple people fight him. Let multiple people have their shot. Or at least let it respawn if someone dies within the, say, first minute of the fight. Something that makes it less grueling and more fair to even attempt the fights. Even if they keep the same design philosophy of it being impossible to clear blind. In that same vein of being new and challenging, we have Castrum Lacus Latour. This is a sort of a much more casual version of the Baldesian arsenal. Much easier to get into, and much easier to complete in a variety of ways. As mentioned in talking about Lost Action slash Logos, we have the preparation phase of Baldesian Arsenal. Some very expensive setups required, and certain 100% required actions if you wanted to not die a horrible death, mostly a single specific skill that revealed traps. The rest of it was all for aiming to tilting the odds in your favor. The second part, and the biggest issue, was the entry. Upon clearing a certain constantly spawning notorious monster, 48 portals would appear on the map. Later in the instance, an additional 8 more portal spawn for the back half. One person could take a portal each to enter the Baldesian arsenal. This is where so many problems come in. Due to the nature of Baldesian arsenal, which I'll get into in a bit, nobody pugged it. The only way to actually get in and do it was to use a Discord or otherwise outside resource. This caused the issue of portal snipers, people who would specifically take a portal just to deny the portal from someone of the pre-organized group. You would bring 56 people for a BA attempt, but almost every run, one or more people would lose their spot to trolls who would instantly leave after getting inside. In the best case scenario, it was a person wanting to do the content themselves, but expecting a carry and refusing to attempt to be organized and helpful. So pugs were unwilling to do it, 
and pre-mage didn't want to have to carry baggage that could potentially kill them all because of traps. This all was stemming because of a permadeath function within the Baltasian arsenal. If you died, you stayed dead. Raises of all forms would not work, with the exception of logos. This is where that expensive setup came in. A specific logos action would have a 70% chance of automatically raising you if you died. If it failed, you had a backup. Healers. Healers had a special logos that would raise dead players, but place doom on them. So unless their 70% chance procced, they would trade their life for yours for no benefit. This would cause a chains of multiple healers trying to raise each other, trying to get that 70% proc. Typically, if you weren't a healer or a tank, a doom raise chance would not be taken on you. DPS were expendable to a degree. Everyone else was not. Take a normal respawn and lose half a level, try again later for failing to do mechanics, or getting killed because the pug ran into a random trap. So, getting in was annoying at best, death was extremely punishing, which on its own is fine, and the fights weren't exactly easy. Especially the final boss, a souped up version of Ozma. You needed to keep up the DPS, keep up the mechanics, and not die for any other reason. This led to two sides who basically entirely agreed with each other, yet antagonistic toward each other. People could be offered entry into the Discord to join a run, only to deny it and say they shouldn't have to join a Discord to do the content, and then never do the content anyway because Pugs never did it because the level of organization and difficulty that was required which is the entire reason people would make full 56-man groups to enter via Discord groups, so they could have some level of organization, callout, and any skills needed for the clear, guaranteed. It all ended up becoming this weird argument that constantly went in the same circle over and over. Baldessian Arsenal was extremely fun when it worked, and frustrating as hell when it didn't. This leads us into Lacus Latour, which is actually not directly analogous to Baldesian Arsenal, but basically is. Much like Baldesian Arsenal, you enter Castrum Lacus Latour from inside the instance. You prep all your skills and ideally a party before heading inside. The first major downgrade is the spawning. At earliest, the first Castrum Lacus Latour of an instance will spawn an hour after the instance begins. The Baldessian Arsenal spawn was much faster than this, at what I remember was being 30 minutes only. Yeah, you're not gonna just sit AFK and not even try to do anything, but an hour is a long time. One of the most annoying things not solved is the pre-made group issue, a part I didn't even mention with Baldessian Arsenal was to get the full 56 players, all 7 parties, you had to get into the same instance, which could involve an hour or more of constant queue hopping to try to get in an instance with 56 open spaces. We're down to 48 people max and 6 parties, and the same issue is here. If you have the ability to get a full group together, you're going to just have to deal with the queuing. Then there's the second layer of queuing. Because Castrum Lacus Latour is actually puggable, pugs will actually queue for it this time. And if a queue fills beyond the 48 players allowed inside, a lottery system takes hold and will randomly kick people out when the queue pops. So you could have been waiting for about an hour for Castrum, only to be denied entry. Same issue, but now even more pronounced if you get an instance where everyone wants to do Castrum. While on the average I tend to only ever see pug groups get 30 people together, sometimes they do all flood into Castrum. I once saw 60 people all queue for it. 12 people at minimum were told no, you're not allowed in. 
and this wasn't a pre-made group either. All 60 people were random pugs who all just wanted to do it. What was before only one or two people being chased out of a run because of trolls or opportunists is now an active problem that can happen any time on an even bigger scale. But at least now, nobody malicious will be taking spots. I hope. Given they've moved on to duels too, I'm not hopeful that there will be people who purposefully queue for Castrum, get in, and then immediately leave. Either way, this pugging is where the biggest issues come into play. You don't know the kind of groups you will get. You might only get 20 people, or otherwise not enough by the group's own opinion, and people bail immediately. An hour wasted. You might get the full 48, but only 3 healers across the whole 48 players, which is 6 parties. I only ever joined pugs when they weren't full. The first run I had joined, I got in a party of 4 DPS. One of them saying they would heal using healing actions. They then proceeded to, on purpose, let two of us die, and they admitted as such in text. That's not just speculation on my end. The second time, I got a party that had a healer. But there was at least one party who had no healers once again, and needed help on the staying alive end. So, because of the nature of pugs, most of them intending to actually join Castum Lacus Latour from the moment they join the instance, the number of required healers will not always add up to enough for everyone. What happens if somehow no healers join? What happens if no tanks? You can't win. There are tank busters that at least require players to use tank lost actions if they aren't actually tanks. And there is a section of the instance with six branches where you want at least six parties to spread out, even if it's one party splitting into two. The instance itself has expectations and how often are they going to be met. And you can't change actions once you're inside. You have to be prepared beforehand. It's a good thing you don't need a super organized party to clear. Just get more rewards. As long as you can beat all the DPS checks, play account is fine no matter how small. But the system has issues, that much is for sure. They even had to hotfix in a longer join timer because people were joining critical engagements as Castrum spawned and got locked out, leading to low play accounts and immediate disbands. Oh, and there's morons who instant pool in here, despite the first boss being one that you need to split into two groups to clear. But sure, go ahead and pull before the group is even ready to start. That won't lead to any issues at all for something that took an hour to get into and half the people who joined didn't even come in with a party. No problems there. <sighs> but much like Baldessian Arsenal, when Castrum Lacus Latour works, it works great and is a ton of fun. Sure, it's basically even easier than your average 24 man, aside from maybe the last boss, but it's still pretty fun to do. And the hard part on the final boss is something you send an elite squad up to do, so it ends up not even being an issue for most of the players. But it's fun! It's different, and it's large scale, something we don't really have a lot of in this game. It's something I want to see more of, and I will. Because there's going to be a savage instance like Baldessian Arsenal. I don't know quite all the details, none of us really do yet, but as far as we can tell, we can directly queue for it now, making the pre-made issue no longer a thing. It'll be hard fun, and something I am extremely glad to be trying when it comes out. But until that day, Castrum Lacus Latour is the closest thing we have to a Baldesian arsenal, and many of the same issues remain, while not being a direct step forward. It's puggable, 
and fully expected as part of the quest line, but pugs will always be pugs, and that's rarely a good thing. And I'll just leave this one final note as one of the dumbest parts of Castrum Lacus Latour. Despite having many of the same functions as a critical engagement, this offers zero metal. No EXP gains at all. This is probably the thing people have been most vocal about, and most vocally wrong about. The biggest complaint I've seen is that Bogia should have the most efficient way of getting the relics, full stop. Instead of Bogia, you can grind Heaven's Word Fates and Dungeons. Drop rates are 100% in these. In Bogia, they are not. They're actually pretty damn low. However, that all depends on how you grind. It is extremely common in Bogia for there to be two or even three cluster farm groups, which I'll get into that in a bit. A single pool in a cluster farm group can earn you anywhere from zero to three whole drops for the relic, depending on RNG. The best part, you don't even need to participate as long as someone, anyone in your party gets the kill on an enemy, you have a chance at the drop. So even with a slight minimum level of effort to organize, you can exponentially increase your gains. If you get into an instance with a second farm group besides the farm group you join, you can do the following. Communicate and team up! Just by talking a little tiny bit, you can suggest to the team to do the following. Drop half your party, ideally the DPS, with the secondary group in their farm spot. Drag the four DPS of the second group to your different farm spot. You now have two farm groups going on at once. Everyone seems to make the excuse, oh, you need to have a ton of friends to do this. No, no you don't. It's so damn easy to just say five words and double your output. There are so many instances that have at least two groups running farms. Get an instance with three groups going and it's going to be the fastest set of relics you could ever achieve. Team A with a tank and a healer or two, Team B with 2-3 to three DPS, Team C with 2-3 to three DPS. Put this setup in each zone, and you now have more relics than you know what to do with. And clusters too. The only reason I can think of you not wanting to go for this method is you have zero interest in Bogia, and only want one or two relics. If you want to do Bogia and have, and you want to farm multiple relics, this is a much easier method than people give it credit for. You don't even need some high skill level to do it. You just do it, maybe put in a Logos action or two to be even stronger, and you're good. But alright, let's take a bit to step back and actually talk about the clusters. These are rewards for killing robot enemies that sometimes drop. The stuff you can buy is mostly really expensive, specifically a special hairstyle and a mount for 150 and 180 clusters respectively. You can use them or sell them for a lot of gil. But the market quickly fell in price. But you can also buy a special buff for 5 clusters which gives you priority in joining critical engagements that go over the player cap but this doesn't work with Castrum or Duels. Either way, the pickings are pretty sparse. This is especially true if you do these super efficient farms by using words and grouping up across multiple parties, but the fact these exist at all is a huge step up from Eureka. The grind for relics in Eureka was grueling and was basically the only thing you could grind for. Sure, there was loot boxes, but that's here too if you want it. And then loot boxes with random loot. 
you can pick your rewards with clusters for as few as they are. There was also bunny groups, but bunnies rarely were worth doing, and the good stuff within gold chests, and even a gold chest could sometimes not give you anything good. But I didn't even mention the best part. Not only do you farm for the relic and the clusters at the same time, you farm for both steps of the relic at the same time. As long as you have both quests active, the one for three types of memories and the one for the bit of memories, both quests can have their drops drop. So the Bosia farm is three things at once instead of doing fates and running dungeons. As said though, you need to have an interest in Bosia itself. Ranking up to rank 8 to be able to access all three zones is a significant time effort, but 6 to 8 hours of ranking up should be enough to get you there. This is likely not much higher requirements than grinding blue to 60 and getting all the skills you need for an efficient farm with a fend to carry you. So pick your poison and your time investment. Do you want one relic? Or many? Do you want to do different content instead of the same thing you already did every day? Or do the same content? Do you want to enjoy new and engaging stories like the one Bosia offers? Or ignore a story entirely? The choice is yours as you make your way for the Shrine of the Silver Monkey. I mean Castrum Lacus Latour. Personally, I'm gonna keep enjoying Bosia because in almost every way, it's a major improvement in what Eureka offered. It's far from perfect still, but I hope that this means they're going to continue to improve on all of it. There's even so much more I could talk about, but I think this has gone on long enough, and this is a good point to finally end it. This content will never be what everyone wants, but this is still far better than what Eureka was. Thanks for watching my little <laughs> opinion piece on Bosia. People are always so hypocritical in what they want with this game, but I am personally glad that they're trying different unique things and trying to iterate on formulas. People complain that they play things too safe with this game, then go on to complain that we're getting less content than ever because we're not getting three dungeons for every expert roulette. Deep Dungeons, Eureka, Bosia, Ultimates, and more all don't actually exist, I guess, because they don't like them. It's dumb. Just because you don't like it, doesn't mean it's not content to do. But I'm glad this exists, and I hope they continue to improve it and make it even better. But anyway, take care, and may the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all of my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to... Kathy Nock, Lemon, Meowfy, and Nick. If you'd like to become one of my Patreons, the link is down in the description. Thanks for watching.